Welcome back to the second hour of our program. On the line with us, our old buddy Phil Itner, the veteran war correspondent based in Kiev, Ukraine. You can watch his video blog, which he regularly updates over on YouTube. Uh, just search for his name, Philip Itner, P-H-I-L-I-P-I-T-T-N-E-R. Um, also, I believe today is five, day 520 of the, of the uh, uh, Ukraine war. Um, uh, and the, the counter uh, counteroffensive was essentially declared, what, two, three weeks ago? How, how is it going? A little bit, little bit older than that. Um, slow, slow. There's a lot of defensive uh, lines and, def and defenses that uh, Russia has installed there. We're hearing in the last 24 hours or so that actually Ukraine is starting to make uh, incremental uh, advances in uh, what is called the Donetsk. Uh, front and that's out near you know Bakhmut and all that kind of stuff and 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 the Donbass, Donetsk and Luhansk, uh, and then uh, down south uh, in what's called the Zaporizhia front. There's also advances being made. Nothing enormous. I, I I can't stress this enough. Every time I get a chance to 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 speak to an audience, um, I I, I try to make this point. Uh, and we've talked about this in the past. This is not, don't think that this is going to be lightning strikes and, you know, gobbling up kilometers or miles of ground and encircling uh, Russian troops. And that may happen if an opening is exploited. But the, the Ukrainians have made it very clear that they are going to do what, the, what in the military, in the, in the U.S. Army, I've been embedded with the Army enough times to have learned this one, is they have a slogan uh, and I'll see if I can get it right the first time here. Um, uh, slow is steady. Uh, steady is smooth. Smooth is fast. Hmm. So it's we're not going to expend our people. We are not going to rush into anything. We are going to gobble up kilometers. We're going to gobble up territory as we push eastward to the sea. That's the objective. Get to the sea and cut off Russia from the Crimean Peninsula, their land bridge from the Crimean Peninsula. And in addition to that, because of the discrepancy between Russians, po Russia's population uh, that they can draw upon, by the way, we're anticipating another uh, 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 conscription period uh, over in Russia, but uh, their population is much larger than Ukraine. So, and also Ukraine fights differently. They don't, they don't, uh, they aren't quite as willing to to throw their forces into the meat grinder. They want to keep them alive because they have fewer of them. And also a survivor, a soldier who survives is a more experienced soldier and he knows how to fight better. So um, they're not going to just chuck Ukrainian forces against the defensive lines of the Russians. They're going to they're going to take it very slow and steady. That's what we're seeing happen. There's been criticism in the West about that, but we are starting to see some movement in these two sectors. Uh, and uh, there's, you know, scuttlebutt and talk of uh, that only kind of increasing. Yeah. Finally, I, I read that uh, Moscow has said, and I don't recall if it was Putin or just, you know, one of their spokespeople, that the introduction of F-15s or other aircraft capable of carrying nuclear weapons into this uh, theater of war, into, into Ukraine, will be considered the crossing of the nuclear line and will therefore uh, authorize or legitimize a, a, a massive and overwhelming response from Russia that, uh, uh, you know, that they've been holding back on up to this point. Um, am I remembering that correctly? And, you know, how, how seriously should we take that? What does this mean? Well, that's the F-16, and it's something the Ukrainians have been asking for since the beginning of, of this conflict or this larger scale conflict because the Russians are right. It has a multi-purpose platform. Uh, you can put all sorts of, uh, uh, you know, air-to-air -air defense missiles, uh, you know, uh, air-to-surface, all sorts of different kit can be put on the F-16, including, yes, um, war, you know, missiles that have a warhead capable of carrying uh, something nuclear. Um, so that's what the Russians are referring to. And in their stated doctrine, in Russia's stated doctrine, for all to read is we will only use our nukes in a defensive posture. But what is a defensive posture if that's what they start to say is uh, is a sign of aggression uh, that they will then in their mindset be be defending against? So would they actually do it the second an F-16 goes into the air o over Ukraine? I mean, do we really want to roll, roll that dice? I'm not sure. But the Ukrainians certainly say 
they need it. And there's their military experts and there are guys who are coming from the front line saying that we we do need better um, systems in the air and they'd like it to be the F-16. Um, you know, look, Russia has drawn red lines in the sand in the past and they've been crossed. Um, but at some point you wonder whether or not, you know, it's going to be one red, red line too, too far. As much as I want to see the Ukrainians uh, succeed on the, on the battle uh, ground and in the air, um, we, we can't, you know, we have to be cautious in all things because right. obviously Russia is a nuclear power. So, well, and that, and that, um, that raises another question. And that, I, my understanding is that, and, and I believe you and I discussed this last week, but um, I, it's worth revisiting that. Russia has moved their, uh, or at least some of their uh, tactical nuclear weapons uh, into Belarus. And the, right. the Wagner Group is now in Belarus. Um, is right. it possible that the use of nuclear weapons, Russian nuclear, tactical nuclear weapons, could be done by the Wagner Group in order to provide some sort of plausible deniability for the Russian military? Well, you, you paint a scary scenario there, but, um, you know... Look, if the if the Wagner group were to launch, you know, to, to be used as a proxy to launch a nuclear attack, I I, I think all auspices uh, of that actually being uh, uh, ordered by Yevgeny Prigozhin uh, will go right out the window. Everybody's going to know if a nuke is used in this region, who who ordered it and right. who, quite frankly, pulled the trigger. So um, the, the the question, the, the, but then remains as always when it comes to, to Russia's threat of using nuclear weapons is what happens afterwards? What's the immediate response? And the immediate response, unless it is a full-scale exchange of nuclear stockpiles, um, in which, you know, we're just done, that's it. Um, but short of that, it's what happens the day after. And what happens, uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's out of various capitals around the Western world is that that's that's it. That's a game changer. Then we're with the, the use of nuclear weapons by Moscow would um, would initiate all sorts of uh, this could escalate uh, into World War three, even if it's it, not a nuclear. It, absolutely. War, a conventional yeah. a conventional war yeah. sparked by uh, a, a limited nuclear exchange. This.